I've got a nice problem involving prime numbers to show you guys today. This is from a viewer and also from the Junior Baltic Math Olympiad. Okay, so let's see what we want to do. We want to find all primes, P, Q, and R, satisfying the following equation. So we've got P to the Q minus Q to the P over P plus Q equals R minus one. And this is a slight rewording of what actually showed up on the test, but this is an equivalent problem. Okay, so let's maybe get to it. So what I'd like to start off doing is reducing this so that there is no fraction anymore so that we just have an equation involving integers instead of an equation involving rational numbers. So we'll do that by saying that this equation is equivalent to the equation p to the q minus q to the p equals r minus 1 times p plus q. And then we'll Kind of obviously, since this is a number theory problem, we're probably gonna want to reduce modulo one of these primes at some point, and also probably use standard facts from number theory like Fermat's theorem and Bezu's identity and so on and so forth. So let's maybe start by reducing mod P. So I'll just write kind of this area, arrow to show that we're gonna reduce modulo P. But if we reduce mod p, that means that this p disappears. It's going to become 0. And then we have minus q to the p. But if we've got minus q to the p, well, then that's just minus q using Fermat's little theorem or a version of Fermat's little theorem. So then we're going to have r minus 1 times q. And this is mod p. So now we've got this congruence. From there, we can maybe multiply both sides by a negative one, and that's gonna give us Q is congruent to one minus R times Q modulo P. But then we can cancel the Qs from both sides of this congruence, and we can do that because P is not equal to Q. So how do we know that P is not equal to Q? Well, notice if P is equal to Q, then this numerator is zero, and we have R minus one is equal to zero, but that means R is equal to one, but that means R is not a prime. So if P was equal to Q, then R would not be a prime, so we know that P is not equal to Q. But then that means that P and Q are relatively prime, so Q has an inverse modulo P. We can, in fact, just like multiply both sides of this congruence by this inverse and cancel these off, leaving us with a one on the left-hand side. But now we'll add R to both sides of this congruence and subtract one from both sides of this congruence and we'll end up with R is congruent to zero mod P. But that means that P divides R. But given that P and R are both primes, that tells us that P is equal to R. So we've determined our first important fact. And that is, if we have a triple of prime numbers satisfying this equation, which is equivalent to satisfying our original equation, then that means that the prime playing the role of P and the prime playing the role of R have to be the same. In other words, P is equal to R. Okay, so let's hang on to that fact and move on to the next step. So in the last board, we determined that P was equal to R if P, Q, and R satisfied this equation and they were all primes. But that allows us to take this R right here and just replace it with P. Now we're going to do two reductions of this equation. One of them is going to be mod Q. And that's kind of an obvious reduction because we've already, already reduced mod P. And at this stage, we know that there are only two unique primes in this setup. And then the next reduction we're going to do is going to be mod P minus 1. And that's motivated by the fact that we have a P minus 1 factor of this right-hand side. Okay, so let's get to it. If we reduce mod Q, then we'll have P to the Q, but that's congruent to P mod Q by Fermat's little theorem. This is congruent to zero mod Q. And then let's see, the right-hand side will be P minus one times P modulo Q. 
So let's see what we can do with this other reduction. So if we're working mod p minus one, then we know p minus one is zero and p is one. So we can make those appropriate replacements. We'll have one to the q, which is one, minus q to the p is congruent to zero mod p minus one. But from here, we can move some things around and we see that q to the p is congruent to one modulo p minus one. Likewise, from an observation on the last board, we know that p and q are not the same prime, but that means they're relatively prime and we can cancel p from both sides of this congruence, leaving us with p minus one is congruent to one mod q or p is congruent to two mod q. So now let's maybe box these because these are gonna be important facts. Although we'll be able to simplify this one over here on the right a bit. And that's using the notion of the order of an integer modulo n. So let's recall that the order of m modulo n is going to be the smallest k, which is a natural number such that m to the k is congruent to one mod n. Then another thing that you can check is that if m to the l is congruent to one modulo n, then l, or sorry, k must divide l. That's an easy exercise using the division algorithm and comes from elementary number theory. So let's keep these two facts in mind along with the fact that q to the p is congruent to one mod p. And that tells us that the order of q mod p minus one, so I can write it like this, order of q mod p minus one must divide p. So that comes from this definition of order and then this divisibility fact that's right here but there are only two different numbers that divide p, and that's one and p. So that tells us that this order mod p minus one of q must be equal to either one or p. But in fact, it needs to be equal to one and not p because it's at most phi of p minus one, which is strictly less than p. So if it's equal to one, then that tells us that q to the one is actually congruent to one mod p minus one, or q is congruent to one mod p minus one. And that's another super important fact that we need. So at this stage, we've got this fact involving the congruence of p mod q, and that fact over there about the congruence of q mod p minus one. Okay, so let's maybe take those two facts up here and then we'll work towards the end. Let's see where we are so far. We've got p is equal to r, p is congruent to two mod q, and q is congruent to one mod p minus one. Now let's use the definition of this congruence modulo n in order to write this as a divisibility relationship. Okay, so this means that q divides p minus two, and this one means that p minus one divides q minus one. Okay, so this is actually going to split off into two cases. And one of those cases is when p is equal to two. So let's maybe just put that case when p equals two over here on its own. Because notice if p is equal to two, everything is okay in this setup. We're definitely allowed to have one divide really any q minus one, that's legit. And then if p is equal to two, well, everything divides zero, so that's also okay. So, but if p is not equal to two, then we run into a problem. And so that's what will work out as we move down here. p is not equal to two. Like I said, if p is equal to two, then we're okay, we can keep going. But if p is not equal to two, then we have q is less than p minus two, I guess less than or equal to p minus two. So again, divisibility means that you are less unless this guy right here is equal to zero. And then we also have p minus one is strictly less than q minus one. Again, that's because p is not equal to q by this observation that we used a while ago.
But now we can subtract one from both sides of this second inequality, leaving us with p minus two is strictly less than q minus two. And then we can fuse these two inequalities together into something that does not make a ton of sense. And that is q is less than or equal to p minus two, which is strictly less than q minus two. In other words, q is strictly less than q minus two. But that's the same thing as saying that zero is less than negative two, which is clearly a contradiction. But remember, everything was okay when p was equal to two, and everything blew up when p was not equal to two. So that tells us that p must be equal to two, and r is equal to two from this blue box right here. Okay, so we'll get rid of this and we'll do our final calculations. So far we know that p and r are both equal to two, and we wanna determine what primes q will make this whole equation here satisfied. But let's see what our equation becomes if we know that p and r are equal to two. So we'll have two to the q, minus q squared is equal to r minus one, but that's just one. And then we'll have q plus two like that. Okay, but now we can maybe move some things around. And that is the same thing as saying that two to the q is equal to q squared plus q plus two. But as we see here, we've got something which is exponential on the left-hand side of this equation and something that is polynomial on the right-hand side of the equation. And we know that exponential type functions grow much faster than polynomial type functions. So that gives us some motivation that the only possible solutions will exist for very, very small values of q. So we might as well check small values of q quickly. So let's check those. We'll check q equals three. So as you recall from what we've used a couple of times, q cannot be equal to p. So the first prime, which is not two, is three. Let's see if that works. So then the equation will be two cubed equals three squared plus three plus two, but that equation does not hold. So Q equals three is not a solution. And notice, in fact, we get that this left-hand side is smaller than the right-hand side. Okay, then let's check Q equals five, and we'll see that that will be two to the five, which is 32. And then you can check that that is equal to 25 plus five plus two pretty clearly. So Q equals five works. So we can save maybe that solution over here. So we've got P equals two, Q equals five, and R equals two. That actually will turn out to be our only solution because as you guessed it, if we have Q larger than five, then this side, which is exponential, is larger than that side, which is polynomial. And we're gonna check that using calculus. Okay, so let's maybe get to it. Let's define the following function. We'll say it's f of x, which is equal to two to the x minus x squared minus x minus two. So let's notice that f of five equals zero because five satisfies this equation. Now what we would really like to show, so I'll write that, want to show that f of x is strictly bigger than zero if x is bigger than or equal to six. But that means we would have no solutions to this equation for values of q that are bigger than or equal to six. So how could we do that? Well, I'm gonna use this trick where we take several derivatives, show all of those derivatives are positive, which means that they will all be increasing and in turn, the function will be increasing. So I'll maybe just sketch it out and you guys can check this. So we can check that f of six is positive. So that's pretty easy. And also f prime of six is positive, f double prime of six is positive, and then f triple prime of x is positive for all x 
bigger than or equal to six. So it's actually kind of hard to check this for a variable x at the first derivative stage and the second derivative stage, but it becomes easier at the third derivative stage. And that's just because all of the polynomial stuff kind of disappears at that point. And I wanna point out that as we do this, we'll use the fact that the natural log of two is bigger than one half. So if you guys wanna like maybe sketch the details in the comments, that would be a good idea. Okay, so let's see how this works again. So f triple prime is positive for all x bigger than or equal to six, but that means f double prime is increasing in that interval, but it's already positive. That means it's always positive in that interval. But if it's always positive in that interval, then f prime is increasing in that interval. It started off as positive, so that means it's always positive in that interval. But that means that f is increasing in that interval, but then again, it started off as being positive, so that means it's always positive in that interval. So in the end, we see that f of x is bigger than zero for all x bigger than or equal to six, which is exactly what we wanted to do in order to show that this was our only solution. And that's a good place to stop.